and welcome to Escaping Kasturbarus, the podcast where we rewatch, reminisce, and review everything Doctor Who from 2005 to present. My name is Rich, and I am joined by the one person who can take the remaining poison and excrete it out of any orifice, Amy. <laughs> hey. I thought of that while I was making you a glass of squash downstairs. I thought, oh no, I've not thought about how to introduce it. I thought, I know what, let's make basically a fart joke. I did but just think, much... what's he going to call me this time? <laughs> a much more sort of uh, eloquent fart mm. joke. We'll put it that way. Sure. But welcome, welcome along, everyone. Apologies for the uh, the sort of radio silence over the last week with whether we were gonna whether you were gonna get an episode of uh, the podcast last week. Uh, I was off work for a week, and I think as far as we were aware, we were gonna do the podcast, and we just kind of didn't didn't so i uh, apologize for that but it it was still quite nice to see lots of people go where's the podcast i really want the podcast so thank you all for the uh, the excitement it really honestly like we're i think we're both quite taken aback as to how much you guys are really enjoying this podcast yeah definitely um so thank you for that but apologies for, for being so quiet but now we're finally here with episode number 11 boomtown boomtown which I think for a lot of people, this is the first time they kind of go, ooh, okay. Hmm. In what way? Hmm. As in, not maybe not liking the episode oh, a right. huge amount. Like, we talked, I mean, this obviously will echo this a lot anyway because of the the the, the villain of the week. Uh, you know, Aliens of London World War Three was always kind of seen as the, eh, it's okay. Mm. And Boomtown has been kind of thrown into that same mix as well. But uh, we'll, yeah, get, we'll get into seems that. seems like a bit of a weird add-on. It does a bit, but this was aired on the 4th of June, 2005, so about, what, two months two, two months and 15 years to the day. <laughs> oh, great. Because uh, it's currently the 3rd of August. Um, and this was, as you said, it's a bit of a filler episode, because, mm. fun fact, originally, this episode was to be written by... I've forgotten his name. Paul Abbott who had written... We've already talked about Paul Abbott. Have we? For, yes, I'm certain <laughs> we... I'm sure we have. I don't know who that is. Or have I we? Or is, he somebody that, is he somebody that writes episodes in the future? I'm trying to find these uh, <laughs> like these episodes because I recognise the name. I can't remember who... What he was supposed to write or he was uh, he was going to be writing or he wrote something in the future i'll have to do my research afterwards there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing to hand here that's showing me very very quickly like oh what episodes of doctor who has he written but anyway this episode was originally going to be or this slot in the mm. series was going to be written by paul abbott and he was going to uh actually have an episode that regard revolved around the doctor having created rose what yeah it's a bit of a that's it's weird. A, it's a bit of a weird one. I don't understand. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was it was quite strange. It was actually in a list on, on Who Culture recently. All right. Uh, I think it might have been the 10 insane episodes of Doctor Who that almost happened. The one with the David Tennant and Potter on oh, the thumbnail. That. I think yeah, it was yeah. that. I, I did the bloody voiceover for that. I should know this. Yeah, you should. And, did I edit it? No, I didn't. I didn't edit it. That was uh, our, our big man Danny, I believe. Um this has already been mentioned before, but yeah, that was the episode that was originally going to take place in the, in this slot. Where apparently, it was going to be called the Void. Right. I think yeah, the Void. But uh, they, it was cut due Obviously. to I think a maybe it's sounding a bit uh, complex to produce, and but also a bit of a yeah, as you say, a bit of a far fetched thing. So instead, Boomtown was put in, and um, Russell T Davies penned this episode. Oh, he did. Not, okay. not Paul Abbott, and he said that he wanted to explore blonde or margaret mm. as we saw her in uh, aliens of london world war three because in reality she's not in it that much no she has the scene alongside the two other guys in the uh, the cabinet room when they take over the uh, army general yeah she has the scene with um harriet and rose when she takes out what's his face oh yeah and yeah. then she does the whole spiel with the doctor in the uh, in the panic room kind of thing that, oh, yeah. that's that's kind of all she's there for but he really liked her and her character, so he wanted to explore it more. Obviously, you don't see her escape the events no. of World War Three, but obviously she does because she rocks up in Cardiff. And the obviously, you know, it's a reused actor, a reused um, prop in terms of the Slovene costume. Yeah, it's easy to produce because obviously Doctor Who is produced in Cardiff. Yeah. So, and as we've already uh, established with um, the Unquiet Dead, they really lean, lean into let's take the piss out of Cardiff while we're yeah. here. 
It's, but, um, um, yeah, it feels like a little bit of a kind of... Because I said to you, didn't I? I was like, I know that we've said before in certain episodes that like nothing happens, but mm. in this one, literally nothing happens. Like yeah. you could sum up the episode by saying everyone's eating lunch, they have dinner, she becomes an egg. Like that's literally <laughs> how you could summarize the episode. It's the most food. Else it's the most food-based episode of Doctor Who. It's lunch, my kind of dinner, episode. egg. egg. <laughs> <laughs> it's my kind of episode. I'm telling you that now. We're gonna put that on a T-shirt on the Who Culture store. <laughs> lunch, lunch, dinner, egg. dinner egg at the end. <laughs> I love that. If we had a store, we don't have a store. Sad I don't face. think we're going to bother with the store. We're already at the BBC on our ass. Like, God damn it. The YouTube channel's been going fine. The BBC haven't turned around and gone, hey, you can't do this. <laughs> I'm not going to push you by designing merchandise and the BBC going, ah. I mean, to why, be fair, if you just Why had didn't a top we that, think of lunch, dinner, egg? I was going to say, if you just had a top that said lunch, dinner, egg, I'm not sure anyone would know what it was on about. <laughs> But then if you are an avid listener to the Escaping Disturbers podcast, then you can strut around the streets of Cardiff <laughs> In a lunch dinner wearing egg your top. lunch dinner egg <laughs> shirts. Oh, dear. <laughs> I really hope at some point in the future, we're out at some kind of convention, or like we go to like EGX, or we go to like a Doctor Who convention, or the Doctor Who experience, or we get invited to the 60th anniversary celebration at the O2 in London, and Lol, someone yeah. rocks up wearing a lunch dinner egg. If you <laughs> rock up with a lunch dinner egg shirt, I will buy you a pint. Or just come up to us and say lunch dinner egg, and we'll no, probably have no idea what I'll, you're on about. I'll give you a high five if you say it, if you actually go through the effort to wear a t-shirt with it on. I'll bake you a cookie. Ooh, it's Amy, <laughs> Amy Cakes dot that um, <laughs> plug. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, you're right. Th- this episode is very much something that, that nothing really happens. And as I've as I've said, there's all there's already that. Um, at least if you've already watched this before and you know how critics and fans responded to it back in 2005, the episode wasn't very like it wasn't massively well received. It wasn't like super hated. It wasn't super loved, but it was just sort of there. I mean. And, and I can I can understand why because yeah. you know the, usually the the explosive action just isn't present. It is it's almost an episode entirely based around exposition. But I oh, think yeah. what makes Boomtown so good when I've now I've gone back to it again because it's again it's not an episode that I sort of forget about. Boomtown is one of the episodes I seem mm. to know really quite well. Um, but I think it's and I'm because not entirely that- sure why. I think it's just the the le- like the 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 ramp up towards the end of the series where I just remember it so so yeah. strongly. But it's like- also probably just because nothing much happens, so you haven't got. So too it's not much exactly to hard to remember. Yeah. yeah. But Boomtown is very much first and foremost a character study. Oh, absolutely. Like, I know we've kind of already said this before about like Father's Day. It's a character study into yeah. into the Doctor, into Rose, but also into Pete. Whereas in this case. You get to see a bit more of a, a bit more of Jack, but you don't really get yeah. much more oh, from him. Jack. <laughs> Just him walking around in what is his like tan, <gasps> his tan jeans and his and blue his tight t-shirt. Top. And I'm mm. just like, John, John, ravish me, daddy. Get in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of looked at him and I was just like, he's so young. He's like, I know, baby it's the John. One, it's the one thing like when you, if you put. A, a, like a close-up of John Barrowman in this episode to him in Fugitive in the, most of the recent Jadun. Episode. And you're just like, wow, you got old. But Whoa, it's also like, baby. it was like 14, probably 14 years between filming. Maybe yeah. maybe even 15 years, actually. Yeah, she would have been, probably would have been probably 15 been years. Probably a bit longer, yeah. Between record, recording for Boontown and recording for Fugitive. So, oh my God. Uh, and we get to see a bit more of Mickey, which I think we'll get to. But obviously the star of the show is Blonde. Blonde, Blonde Fell Foch. Blonde Fell Foch. Passamere de Slitheen. Who you always go, what's her full name to me? It's like a trivia thing and I'm like, I it's don't a, know. It's a good trivia question played by uh, Annette Badland and you said at one point that she is just so perfect. Oh, she part. is. I mean, like, you look at the way that she kind of delivers all of her lines and she has that very kind of all the time she's got that kind of seething undertone but then she's also got that like she's almost like professor umbridge in a way i'm re-listening to order of the phoenix on audiobooks by the way so that's why i brought it up but like she's oh yeah that's got... solely why you brought up Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, shut okay. up Ugh. and um but like she's got that very kind of overlying like i'm not doing anything wrong i'm so nice and lovely and, and she's got that constant like 
oh, I hate everything and everyone and I'm going to be a massive, like, arse about it. But yeah. just, she just is so perfect. Like, the way she kind of looks and, like, uh, this, you know, might sound a little bit horrible, but in the same way that Umbridge was, um, what's her name? Who plays Umbridge? Oh, my God, my brain. Uh oh no it's it's really bad because as soon as Imelda you put Imelda Staunton as soon as you put it on me I'm like I've just <laughs> I've blanked as well blank um in the same way that Imelda Staunton was kind of offended because the character of Umbridge was described as toad like it's kind of the same thing here like she's not pretty but she's not supposed to be because she's got that that kind of um haggard kind of look to her which gives her that kind of evil undertone but also just like the lighting effects of like when she's talking to the doctor the tardis and like you know she's lit she's by the that only blue one light. she's only one being lit blue everyone else um, is being lit and it really m- highlights semi-naturally yeah, yeah it really highlights the kind of lines on her face and just like the way her teeth are like you know are kind of like gritted all the time and but yeah. she just has that very uh, just an amazing way of portraying this kind of half and half like i'm a villain but i'm also truly begging for my life but then at the same time i know that like i'm still evil but i'm also trying to convince you that i'm not evil and i just think the whole the way she plays it like we were talking about um that scene in the restaurant with her and the doctor weren't we and i said about that part where it's a couple of like because they have like maybe three jumps to the restaurant, don't they? They have like the first Yeah, bit. there's like almost three acts to and it. And then they and have the like the scene one. where she's trying to like thingy. And then, yeah, in the last one where they're kind of having that proper deep conversation sort of bit. I said to you that you, it's really, really interesting the way they make that such a close shot. Because literally all you can see is from like just above their eyebrows to like just below their chin. Maybe not even that, maybe like cutting a bit shorter. Yeah. And you can see the doctor's eyes are like shirky and kind of like shifting around. And I think obviously Eccleston plays that kind of like back and forth really well. Yeah. But she is just laser focused. Like her eyes do not move for the entire scene. And obviously that's probably good direction. Um, But also the way she just kind of focuses on that one spot and does not move. Like people's eyes move naturally. That's a thing. So you have to really train your eyes to be able to not move like at all and she just yeah. is so focused and it makes her that it almost kind of gives her that alien quality because you don't really think about the fact that she's not moving them until you notice it and then you're like oh it's like when someone doesn't yeah. blink as often it's it's like yeah i was about to say it's like in in toy story when none of the toys blink at this like both their eyes blink at the same time yeah you look at something like scott pilgrim when none of the characters blink through the entire film Oh my god, I've of, never noticed that. Yeah, That's they cool. do it to they do it to play upon upon the fact they're meant to be like comic book characters, and obviously yeah. you don't see you don't see printed Current images. Comic, yeah, blink. yeah. Um, so they, they play up into that, but yeah, you're right. Like that that sequence, I've never really noticed that before. The idea of it's it's because obviously the Doctor's like looking from eye to eye. It's mm. like here here's a big mind blowing thing for you listeners out there. You can never look somebody in both eyes at the same time unless you're next a very ta- good distance away. <laughs> next time you're looking at somebody relatively close up, realize that you can't look into both people's eyes at the same time you can't breathe in and out of both nostrils at the same time yeah i know but that's a bodily function that's just like "Eh." anyway um yeah that i'd never noticed that that she is like completely laser focused but while you literally just as you mentioned that when you said about there being three separate sections i was sort of very quickly replaying the back in my head the first time we see them in the restaurant the doctor is sat on the left of the frame Mm -hmm. margaret is sat on the right yeah and this is when margaret is trying her best to like get the doctor out of her way so she yeah. like, empties empties the contents of her ring into the glass she shoots the dart out of her finger she does the whole uh poison the, gas the thing. breathing poison gas thing which i always thought i love that sequence that so is much so funny. just the doctor being one step ahead of her and just the look on his smug ass face <laughs> i know when she's like just checking and he properly goes like, and then he goes I know, steak I know, and I know, chips I know, I know that you guys can't see it but it's just that proper big like massive grin of ha 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 screw you um, <laughs> I love that sequence but and yet when the tables turn and Blonde or Margaret is now not necessarily in control of the conversation but she's outing the Doctor for who he mm. is because the, the whole point of this episode aside from as you say nothing happens there's no big threat there's no explosions the, amount, the only amount of running we get is Margaret's trying to escape and then when the rift opens which is like beginning and end and there's like very little running there's no big explosions you got the TARDIS sparking and stuff but it's nothing super huge that you really get it's not a big adrenaline pumping episode Mm. Um, but 
seeing like all this 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 character stuff happen when the uh when margaret's there saying to the doctor like i know like the doctor says oh you know you let one person go it's only uh, as a means to self-justify yourself and everything else you do and she says like that's almost spoken by a true killer she mm-hmm. flips the tables and now now she's got the doctor in a headlock whereas it was the other way around yeah because she's then sat on the on the left whereas he was sat on the left exactly they've, like... I, i've always wondered why they put the camera the other side of the table because you know i as i've said i think i've already said this on the podcast i studied media production at university mm-hmm. so doing like compositions of shots and stuff that's breaking the 180 degree rule yeah. which in the same shot you just don't do and it's kind of strange as to why they would do that at this point because it surely it would have been easier in a production sense just to stay to in just the same keep place shoot, keep the cameras in the same place and just shoot the back and forth the whole time frame the way it is but obviously they flip the cameras to the other side of the table to show that the position of power the i.e. the left of turned. the frame has now been taken over by margaret and that's and- also kind of displayed in the way that they are so close to because i think in a way, they're almost closer to her face than they are to his, like, in a, in a very slight way. I don't yeah, know if it's just I, because I, he has a longer face, um, it in could which be, case yeah. they have to just she be def- a bit She definitely does have quite a round face, yeah. but you, no, you're right, yeah. There, there's a lot to actually dig into for the cinematography. It's actually, like, as as said, like, as a media student, I don't know whether you... Did you do any kind of media stuff at... No, I did English level? literature instead of English media. I decided I was Fair. one of the literature artsy people. <laughs> yeah. Um, I realise I should know this about you, but I just... Yeah, I mean, six and a half years, what? (laughs) Shut up. Um, (laughs) Like, actually digging into the cinematography is never something I thought we'd we'd touch upon so much in in, this I suppose you've watched it so often, you don't really think about it. You don't really think about it. Now I I don't need to worry about the plot so much itself because I know what happens every Mm. time. Um, Maybe not until later in the series when we start to see more episodes that we don't remember as well. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, like, there's a lot of later on episodes. Like, like, I remember quite a lot of them from season one and season two. But after that, like, things get hazy for me. <laughs> there's a bit, yeah. Season four is one that I'm that I'm not like as super hot on compared mm. to like seasons one and two. Um, Matt Smith's era, I know relatively Vaguely. well. I've obviously not watched it anywhere near as much as uh, as the Russell era. I think I've watched Same that Same with one Capaldi. The most. And then obviously Jodie's stuff is still quite fresh. Yeah. So, I, you know, anyway. But um, one other thing I was going to just quickly jut in with about Margaret's character is um, during that scene where um, she's in the TARDIS and she's down on the floor and like Jack and the Doctor are up on the thing. Um, and that's when she's asking for the final meal and jack brings out the bracelets and stuff um the handcuffs is it he calls them um you get this really kind of fascinating because i was watching it and i was like it confused me a little bit but then i sort of understood why is you get that shot where he says oh don't worry because i've got these if she goes more than 10 feet away she gets zapped blah 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 um she does like a jump and like a kind of shudder almost as if to be like a little bit put off by this but then I think she, she doesn't really know where he's going, where he back, where he's going with yeah. what these bracelets do. But yeah. she kind of like takes like a step back, almost to protect, like you know how people do when they're kind of like shocked by something or like a bit yeah. scared. But then she turns the table so quickly by sort of turning around and going, "Oh, dinner in bondage," and it's that like again that kind of repeating motif. She's always trying to get to the get like the, the, power, leg up the leg over up over because she's always Even- doing it. Even when she says, like, the emergency teleport only takes one, because the doctor says, like, why didn't you teleport everyone out and so on yeah. and so forth. And she says, oh, I ended up on a skip, it ended up in a skip on the Isle of Dogs. And Jack and the doctor start laughing, as you would. Mm-hmm. Just picturing Margaret la- or Big Slitheen landing in a skip. Yeah. Like, thank God she somehow had her... Uh... Actually, you know, because they were, they were trying to put their skins back on, weren't they? Yeah, so they when probably they just When they realised the missile was coming, so she then... obviously managed to get hers on. Um, she then starts laughing along with them and again I think that's a case of I'm putting myself back at the same level as you mm-hmm. and now I'm going to get the leg up it's like saying oh you know if you don't do what we uh, I'm going to go very dirty with this if you don't if you don't uh, do what we say we're going to whip you and then you go oh no oh that's such a shame yeah because I love being whipped <laughs> oh Jesus <laughs> sorry like, people <laughs> sorry unless you really wanted to hear that yeah uh, I don't even want to hear that. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, that's why I did it. Um, she always has that like upper hand, even though you you may think otherwise. And like when in the restaurant she's saying like I've changed, like mm. I have become, become a new person, and so on and so on and so on. Like 
you know that she hasn't. You know mm-hmm. that deep down she's still the same bitch fell fosh. <laughs> bitch fell fosh. Casimir days of the end. Yeah, exactly. Blonde she's still bitch. the same person. But you do get to explore that side mm-hmm. of Margaret because she said she's you know she's managed to live within society. It's been six months since the uh, the events of Aliens of London World War Three, and she's managed to incorporate herself into Cardiff society. She's managed to end up being mayor. Admittedly, Margaret Blaine as a person, the old Margaret Blaine, the real Margaret Blaine, mm-hmm. had some her some some credit to her name. Anyway, I don't know what I don't know what I can't remember whether it's ever actually said what was she was. I don't know. Uh when she was in Downing Street, I can't remember. No I think idea. she was just sort of I don't know she was obviously one of the initial guard. She was all straight there. But um obviously she's lived as a human. Like I Obviously, with uh, with that reporter rep- saying about uh, all the people that were killed, yeah, due to this Blyd Drug project, project, like the whole like um, it was going was it? to the oh, bathroom. I can't, wasn't I, can't, it? I, can't, I can't, I can't, I don't know why. Uh, oh, the, uh, it's not my fault that um, danger explosives was written only in Welsh. Yeah. And <laughs> the electrocution of that swimming pool, my car couldn't stop, and then oh, he slipped on an icy patch. He was decapitated. It was, it was a very a icy patch. <laughs> yeah. I turned to you and said, like as a kid. I don't want decapitated, man. I just thought, oh, very icy patch, cool. And then you realise, oh. Oh. Like, it's not torchwood. They can't show someone's head getting cut off. Not mm. that they've ever shown someone. It's actually, no, they have shown somebody's head getting cut off, kind of, in torchwood. Um, they couldn't show in Doctor Who's. They can only, like, talk about it. Yeah. And it's still quite a gruesome thought. Mm. But yeah, while while she's killing for to try and cover herself up. Kind of like what he, she does right at the beginning. The the, uh, the cold open gives you the rundown of the episode that goes straight into it. As we've said, we always, yeah. we really like to see that. Um, she's killing to cover herself. And something I discovered just before we started recording, uh, as someone who is a big fan of Remembrance of the Daleks, you might know this, Cash. maybe. Um, Not at all. There's, a, a, there's an undertaker who appears in Remembrance of the Daleks. This is 1988, uh, who gives the doctor the, the casket that has the hand of Omega in it. Uh, that character, the Undertaker, who who goes on the phone and makes the link between 1963 uh, William Hartnell and Sylvester McCoy, he's actually the bloke who gets killed right at the beginning of this episode. And I never knew that. And I've just read that. And I was like, oh my God, I thought I kind of recognised him. And it's because he passes out in 1988 when he sees a floating coffin. And then Fun he fact. wakes up in 2005. And then he wakes up in Cardiff <laughs> and gets killed by a slitheen. Great. Sucks to be you, mate. Um, but yeah, like he, uh, oh, sorry, not he, Margaret, you get to see her becoming more of Margaret, basically. Mm. You, you, you see her become that kind of person, like the way that she's been living as the mayor, that she managed to work her way up, like legitimate, I say legitimately. Well, you well, can't exactly, you can't is. really exactly kill your skill to the top of being mayor. At least I don't know that. Unless you kill the mayor out. and you just kind of step in. <laughs> I killed the evil king. Now it's my turn to rule. <laughs> um, She's had to live as a person and you see her grow as a person. Like the fact that she chose Blyde Droog, mm. like as something well. She could have just called it the, I'm going to blow your world up and ride it into the pandemensal <laughs> surfboard evil. out of here. I'm a, I'm not a she, I'm a thing. Um, <laughs> she could have called it that, but she doesn't. She, uh, I pointed out to you, like when she has the old stomach gurgle when she's taking what's her face away to mm. inevitably kill her because she knows too much. She goes to the bathroom and says, all girls together. And it's like, that's not... Unless the Slitheen have the same approach to women in nightclubs (laughs) in the UK. (laughs) That's very true. They don't all go to the toilets together. I mean, let's face it, in our our, uh, our city of meeting Coventry, uh, the old Cas... The old... The city of us meeting. Uh, I thought you were like, city of meat. I was like, wait, what? The city of meat. The city of meat. (laughs) When anyway. we met in Coventry, uh, the club there, the Casbah or the, the Kasbah. Collie, the Collie as it's, collie I, have to, I, I have to, I have to refer to it as the Collie now for most people who I know from Coventry because they were locals anyway. Collie um, Boppin. They they had a toilet that was oh, literally two was... porcelain thrones in one cubicle. Were you was so yeah? I've so seen in pictures the, of it. In the I've girls seen a toilet, picture of it. It was like yeah. a, it wasn't two. It was three. I'll have you find three in the corner. So basically, the wall was it was a just a standard rectangle like- bathroom. So on the yeah. back, like as you come in, you've got the like side wall, the back wall, and then like the back wall, and then the sinks. Right, sinks and toilets right. are opposite each other. Um, you've got toilets along the far wall, and then you've got toilets along like the left 
wall and where they met in the back corner there was a corner cubicle that had three toilets in it in one like thing so that three girls three friends could just go in we together home friends. i mean <laughs> i mean you never know because you you have no idea how many girls make friends in toilets and literally come out like not knowing who they are but like going oh my god you're so beautiful oh my god you need to believe in yourself oh my god dump him he's such a bastard and like, the gents toilets in a nightclub are completely dead silent <laughs> apart from the bloke who's offering you have to shave on the sink and you're just like dude go away please i don't care that you've handed me a paper towel i'm not paying for a spritz of whatever crap you've got here see honestly the amount of random people random girls i've spoken to in bathrooms that have gone i love your dress or oh my god you're so pretty and i'm just like oh thank you so much girls at nightclubs <laughs> sound so much nicer than guys at nightclubs. honestly yeah we are it's because we're all bloody drunk out of our faces but yes yeah, so i mean anyway. so are we i mean when, when i say i don't know whether to gross generalization but when blokes <laughs> get drunk they either get sad and tired like me or they just get angry um but yeah all girls together so obviously uh it seems to be that on the way between landing in a skip on the Earl of Dogs in Cardiff, Margaret stopped off at the Collie in Coventry. <laughs> and had an all goes together made a, fr- in made the a club friend club. and went for a piss. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> and in the same way that when when the doctor questions her on why she's called it Blyde Through, she's like, "Dear God, I sound like a native." Because she's like, "Oh, London won't care if the whole the whole South Coast can fall into the sea, and London won't care." Oh God, you know, she has become Margaret, Margaret, or like more human mm. almost. She's she's it's it's like when I when I moved up to Newcastle like three and a half years ago. Whenever I went home, I'd always have people go, "Oh, you're not a Geordie." I'm like. No. no, I'm not a Geordie because <laughs> I'm not a Geordie. Don't change your just life. Cause, just because I live in Newcastle doesn't mean I'm going to pick up you the You absorb lingo. Geordie by osmosis. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I think I picked up from living in Coventry for three years was was saying sound. So, like mm, that's a very middle middle Jesus Christ that's a very Midlands, mid- Midlands thing because yeah. uh, we in Northampton said sound quite a lot oh, you see sound. I'm technically from the Midlands as well I'm from the East Midlands but no one said sound yeah me too but like lower but, down and that's like the only thing I picked up but like yeah it's it's like that like, whenever I've gone home genuinely I've seen I've seen people and they go oh hi and I go hi there and they're like oh you're not you, a Geordie. Like, you don't say why I man every sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't say why I man. But um, yeah, Margaret's picked all this stuff up. And then while the doctor is like, as as we've already said, like says, you know, you can spare whoever you like. You're still a cold blooded killer. At the end of the day, we're going to take you to justice because screw you, basically. She's trying to convince me that she's changed. And you do get to see that a lot. And I think if it weren't for her constant attempts to try and like poison the doctor and then obviously the eventual escape using the extrapolator mm-hmm. wide into the TARDIS, blah, 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 blah. I feel like that you could have really come to sympathize with Blonde. Yeah, well, Even though when you take it back to the t- episodes just gone, they were going to nuke the entire bloody oh, yeah. planet, I know. for God's sake. And even in this one, she's still essentially trying to nuke the entire planet just like not in so much of a direct way Um, as mickey says like you'd you'd kill an entire planet just to catch a lift yeah literally um but it does it kind of makes you this is why the character study i think is so effective because obviously it does show you that there's like you know it's not all about black and white it's uh to Mm. quote serious black again order of the phoenix um Uh. shut up the uh the world isn't split into good people and death eaters um and it kind of is like you know it shows you that she has that kind of gray element to her like she's saying all this stuff like oh i was brought up wrong like i was made to make my first kill at 13 and all this stuff and it, it but then she's also like i think she is genuinely begging for her life despite the fact that she doesn't really intend to do anything good with that life she's still begging for it because obviously yeah. no one it's, it's your life yeah exactly it's your life um but yeah, you do have that genuine kind of like, do I feel sorry for her? Like, and is the doctor a bad person by doing this? And like, she says to Mickey, obviously, you're very quick to like, wash your hands in my blood. But, you know, we would all agree that, I, I mean, personally, I would think we all, we would all agree watching it, that we yeah, would agree yeah, with yeah. Mickey. Like, you know, she does deserve it because she tried to nuke Earth and she was going to literally just sell it to make a profit and all this kind of stuff. And But then it's like, you know, you don't know why she is the way she is and that's obviously what this episode tries to delve into is like why people are the way they are and it questions the doctor's morals as well because we've always talked about the doctor's morals haven't we and like brought up the fact that eccleson's morals seem to be very much the kind of um 
as long as one I'm, strike and you're out yeah like i'll give you a chance but if you break that chance that's it but as long mm-hmm. as i'm not doing the killing then it's not my problem it's basically eccleson's doctor's mantra um yeah well not mantra per se but you know what i mean um it's just, it's where his moral compass yeah, points um which i actually don't mind because at least it's a moral compass instead of the tosh that we had with jody's doctor but that's a different story yeah. um and uh, yeah, it definitely brings into question whether, like, Eccleston's doctor is a bad person. Would we do the same thing in that situation? Because, like, if we were, I'm not sure that any of us could hand someone over knowing they were going to be executed. Um, yeah. And eventually, obviously, this does get to the doctor because she's sat in the restaurant and he says, "What else can I do?" And she's obviously like, "You know, oh, you could take me back to other Slitheens. You know, there's tons of us." And he's like, "But you'll just carry on. Like, how can I?" believe that you'll actually do anything and obviously the doctor's suspicions are right in the end like it's proven no, when yeah. you know she's but she does give you that like i've always got confused by this episode in the past because she always gives you that like and this is obviously her flipping the tables and the doctor manages successfully to always stay one step ahead even when it gets to the end and she's trying to rip apart the tardis he knows what's going to happen because you see that smile or at least on his he face. hopes yeah anyway, he knows what's going to happen um, because you see that smile on his face in the end that's kind of like you know you've opened the tardis blah 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 but um she always flip-flops between being that kind of evil face like that evil smile she gives that very very kind of good evil smile um that many people probably couldn't portray very well um but then she also gives a very good kind of pleading eye like when they've got those very close shots in the restaurant you can see tears in her eyes when she's like pleading and she's like i'm begging for my life sort of thing um and I thought that was really key to sort of being like, do I forgive her? Do I care if she dies? Do Like, am I a bad person if I want her to die? Because, like, I'm the sort of person that, like, you know, doesn't feel like wishing death on anyone is, like, ever a thing. Um, mm. And so it does really make you sort of think, like, you know, as Margaret says, does handing me over to the slaughter make you any better than my actual executioners? All right. Yeah. Anyway. I think that's one of the reasons why this episode gets overlooked so much. Because, yeah, as we said, in the grand scheme of things, not masses happens. It is more of a character study, sort of almost like a duologue between Mm. the Doctor and Blonde through the entire thing. And admittedly, the ending of the Heart of the Tardis opening and reverting it back to an egg is quite abrupt. (laughs) And it is very... It's... I don't want to use this phrase. Oh God, go on. But I'm going to anyway. It's a very moffat. I was ending. knew you were going to say it's a very moffat. It's all resolved in the space of thirty it's seconds. It's like okay, we've got the the length of a finger snap. Let's try and get this wrapped up, mm-hmm. and that's very much what it is. But the only thing I would give, like this bit, credit to is the fact that it does not foreshadow, but it gives both yeah. Rose and the viewer that sort of ammunition slash knowledge to what the how the TARDIS what, is. what what happens later but we'll get to that um but yeah the fact that they the fact that russell wrote blonde as this manipulative character because yeah she makes it she she portrays or she she pleads in such a way to the doctor but it also works so well with the audience mm-hmm. that it makes you sit there and think should i be siding with you is the doctor wrong and there is at no point in this whole episode the, the, the doctor is wrong and i wouldn't even say in my opinion no. there is no point in this episode where the doctor is wrong no because he being doesn't too careful he doesn't because he is sort of... completely in the right as you said his moral compass points to you have one chance mm-hmm. if you blow it i'm going to destroy you basically yeah and she's already blown it just because it's a new place it's a new city it's a new time doesn't mean she gets a, doesn't mean her, her slate is wiped clean Mm-mm. she tried to kill Doctor Harriet and Rose and the entirety of the Earth, yeah. and they killed multiple people in the process. She is already out of here. Yeah, so she's done for. She wasn't going to get that chance, but the fact that it was written as such a way to make make it seem like, or may even make the audience think, should I be giving her that chance? That is one of the reasons why this episode needs to be better Reckon- regarded yeah, yeah. than it is, because yeah. It's, it is it is very much a filler episode. It's something that was made on the cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how cheap it would have been because, I mean, the CGI is pretty simple. Admittedly, the uh, the scene of her in the bathroom taking the skin suit off is a hell of a lot better than oh, the rest yeah, of them. Oh, yeah, I noticed Admittedly, that as well. Admittedly, 
it's probably because they had to pay for one of those sequences and rather not than like 15 billions of them like they did in uh <laughs> aliens and the world war three because literally as soon as the episode started you were like oh for god's sake i can't be doing it the fact that this is going to happen over and over but and it over only and happens over once again. doesn't it but it happens like you you get a background uh unskinning at Light the beginning shot, yeah and you get a, a more full-on one uh, uh you know about a, a quarter of the way in so and that's it and then, it's thank god it's it's a budget episode that is really really good it's also um and i i i think it was what the, the the amount of resources money whatever that russell had to play with he managed to make something that yes on the outside very much is and very blatantly is uh uh a filler episode admittedly for the rest of this series a lot of things get reused yeah uh from here on out like it's only a limited like a finite number of things i think about we're going with the video game analogies again when you're using like the same area twice mm-hmm. for like different things you just maybe reskin it you maybe paint it a different color yeah. you think of like the old mario games where the bushes and the, sh- the clouds are the, are the same, same sprite they just yeah. got different color palettes you think of something like split second where massive uh world arenas like huge levels are built and they make two tracks out of them rather than one yeah like they do stuff like that they reuse all these assets to make it cheaper but he does something with it that makes it interesting if you want a big action-packed explosive episode boomtown is not we're going to get it no but if you want something that really explores it's more so blonde the doctor you get these fantastic lines from him you get his sort of smugness his mm-hmm. smirks like he's completely oblivious to everything until the extrapolator kicks off um, but he again as you said he still kind of has that hopeful ace up his sleeve that thankfully goes his way yeah but it is more so about exploring blonde mm-hmm. and when you think about aliens and the aliens of london world war three she is the slitheen character you think about the most mm. because i feel like she's the most interesting she's the least comic relief compared to the acting prime minister and the general yeah she is interesting i don't really and think I, about them all that much no, I, I always forget they exist and just think, oh, Gilbert, I've to listen to these two make sort of kind of homoerotic things in the lift <laughs> to each other and then lots of fart jokes. Yeah. Whereas she, she made the she shaking my booty depth joke. She has character. But she, there's so much more to her and the fact we get to explore that is something that I don't think should have a stick shooketh at Shooketh. It. <laughs> shooketh at it. No, I mean, like, like in the way she kind of like... Um... Because when we were watching it, I was thinking in that bit where obviously everything starts shaking and Rose goes, oh, is that thunder? And then the, the restaurant kind of like explodes or whatever it does. Um, yeah. When the doctor's like, don't think you're running away. And she's like, oh, I'll stay with you. It's like you look at it and you almost go, oh, she's actually not trying to escape. But then you look at it and you go, no, this was her plan all along. And it's that constant like back and forth and back and forth of like, is she, isn't she, is she, isn't she, that is like done so well throughout the whole episode and you know you don't really need much more i mean i do obviously one of my favorite ever scenes is when they're all sat in that like little bistro cafe thing at the beginning and they're all like jack's telling that and story. jack's telling a story i love that bit like it's just so nice um you don't see it often you don't no. see the pit stop you don't see so, anything it's so cool it's one of those like things that i feel like modern who with, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but like Rose of, is obviously telling Mickey in this episode about like, oh, we went to this place and we went to this place. And it gives you that sense of scope that they do things outside of the episodes that we're seeing. Whereas you don't get that in like the more recent thing, like in the more recent ones. I'm not sure about Jodie's. I think Jodie's is kind of like that as well in ways. Like I think she does do things which you just saw what, you don't the, really what they do about. is what you see. No, no, no. I think Jodie's, I think in Jodie's, I do remember them saying about certain places that they'd been to that hadn't been like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does happen occasionally, um, yeah. But, like, I don't recall throughout Matt's series at all any of this being, like, a thing, like, all of the places that they went to were televised. I mean, I know that there's those clips of, like, Amy and Rory coming back and they're older, and I'm pretty that's sure we've had this the, exact yeah, conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. before, but, like, it's nice to feel like what exists is much more rooted in... um like outside of the show and i think that's also demonstrated really well in jack and rose in this episode because obviously we know that jack is with them because of the last episode where he obviously gets rescued and gets onto the tardis but we don't know how long they've been there so like jack could have gone on a few trips with them he could have only been on this one but it seems like he's it sounds like he's been there a while um he wouldn't have his head around the tardis as well as he did and um 
I think also Rose's character development really jumps up a notch here because even in the last episode, she's like, we don't know how much time has elapsed since like the Doctor dances and Boomtown. And she's really kind of stepped up a notch in like all the stuff she's... She's super confident. Yeah, yeah, like, you know... Like she's, she's past the point of how we've seen her up to this point, which is just... I'll go with whatever yeah. I see. Whereas now she's just like, she kind of expects it mm-hmm. all. She's and like, yep, screw it. We're just going to do it. Because in the Doctor Dances, she's very kind of, what's going on? Like, I don't understand. What's this? Whereas in this one, she's very, very kind of like, yep, I understand what you're talking about. We're talking about this. Like, I fit in. And it is very much that kind of like three, like way banter between them that makes you feel that kind of deep, like um, thing of like, oh, you know, they've been travelling for a while, they've all become, like, really tight-knit group of friends. And obviously Mickey says it too. He's like, oh, do you three hear yourself? Do you think you're clever or something? And they all go, yep, yep, mm -hmm." And, like... And then Jack slaps him. What? He's literally just met him. Does he? You don't see that bit. Yeah. He he says, like, oh, you think you two are all so good, don't you? And then, like, Doctor says yes, Rose says yes, and then Jack says yes, then he slaps him in the face. Well, just, like, a light kind of, like... Sort of, yeah, but I think Mickey's a bit miffed by the whole thing because obviously this is a dude he's just met. He's got no idea who he is. Yeah, he's like, oh no, there's a really attractive guy in uh, <laughs> the TARDIS with my girlfriend. <laughs> in fact, you know what? That's a really good segue. Let's talk about Mickey and Rose because we haven't seen Mickey since Aliens of London, have we? Mm. Abash, you know, technically we see him in Father's Day, but he's about four years yeah, old. Yeah, that doesn't really count. Um, no, um, and bless him. He comes all the way to Cardiff. Yeah. Which I can't speak for train prices back in 2005, but... Probably a lot cheaper Cardiff, than they are now. L- London to Cardiff nowadays. Oof. You might as well buy Cardiff. <laughs> um, he comes all the way to get her passport to... Uh, and she even says, like, I, I didn't really need my passport. I'm guessing I just want to see you. Mm. Um, Mickey then does the whole... Oh, you know, we can go get a drink, have a pizza. And it's like, Mickey always wants pizza and that's fine. I'll I'll have a Mickey that always wants pizza. <laughs> I'll just have can the we pizza. Always ha- can we always have pizza? <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's the main reason why I want a Mickey. So I want to have pizza all the time. Um, and then he's like, uh, do you want to get a hotel room? Yeah, that bit as well room? that you never really realise as a kid is like, oh, yeah. we'll get a hotel on us. And, even, stay and the night. You, can see, you can see the look on his face where he's kind of a bit sheepishly being like, and I think Rose is kind of there like, I've just been in the TARDIS with Captain Jack for God knows how long. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go, Bone. And then he kind of drops the bombshell of, I'm seeing Trisha Delaney. Yeah. Um, and Rose is like, what, bitch? <laughs> what the flip? Like, what? And I think it's, I think Mickey, I guess, bless him, was so excited to see Rose again. He was ecstatic. Like, you see how kind of, like, he's so taken aback by Jack. And then once he's got Rose alone, he's kind of like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm sorry to see you and stuff like that. And it's really quite lovely. You do sort of forget that they're only meant to be like 19, don't you? Because, I mean, obviously they're played by I mean, quite... I'm guessing Mickey's obviously meant to be in his early 20s. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously we, we know he's a few years older but than still, her based like, on I Father's mean, Day. But still, like, I mean, being 25, um, if I, if you know, at sort of 21 years old, you know, we were quite mature, I feel... But, you know, Rose is 19 and, like, most 19-year-old girls are just that. Like, they're 19-year-old girls. I can't picture the fact that she's 19. No, exactly. And that's what it means. You kind of forget. And this is... I think Mickey's character has a very mature emotional weight in this episode because normally Mm -hmm. most of the time you see Mickey and you're just kind of like, oh, here he is. The Like, you know, you do believe the Doctor, Mickey the idiot. And, um... You know, you get to that kind of point where you're like, why is Mickey coming in all the time? Like, you know, not all the time, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, you want Rose to be with the Doctor. You're happy with Rose being the Doctor. But you know, from Mickey's perspective, yeah, she did just up and leave him. Like, you know, after all that stuff had happened with the blooming uh, brain, what? Autons. That's the one. Um, I was going mannequins. I was like, I mean, they were, but like, no. I mean, you're close enough. Um after all of that stuff happened with the Autons, she literally just left him in a pile of trash bags, like, at the side of the thing. <laughs> yeah, quite literally, actually, yeah. And he just kind of has to sit there and is like, oh, so I guess that's it then. Like, you're just literally, you've just left He's just going to go. Um, and it's no wonder that he tries to date someone else. I mean, you know, it, it, it's completely... I think he's completely right in saying, like, you up and left me. What was I supposed to do? But at the same time, he's obviously still got that very deep rooted like i love you like you know yeah we he were says like and... how, how long would, how long do i have to wait for you because i will yeah i i will see other people i will go and hit 
I'll go hit Trisha Delaney, even though, you know, you said all oh, she, she used to be fat. Mm-hmm. And Mickey's like, she lost weight. Or it's just a case of, it's it's something. It's a connection. Yeah. It's something like, it's something that could go I somewhere. I know she's always going to be at the corner shop. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I'll go buy a 39p energy drink and get a quick bone in, you know. <laughs> oh. <He> can... <laughs> Classy. He still has. He ha- that's a that's a definite thing he has, but he doesn't have Rose, mm. and it's good to see that in the in the future of the next series, at least, that they start to rekindle something. But it's I'm I'm really quite excited to go through series two mm. now that we've sort of looked into Mickey and Rose a bit more because I don't really see them as much as a couple in series two. No, I don't I really feel see like them a couple just... past the first episode. To be honest, no, I, yeah, that, that's true. Um, he he's just sort of there he's like almost like a friend mm. it's kind of like it, it's going against that trope of if you have an ex you got to hate them like thick which i just find so archaic yeah, and stupid it's um like he, he's there along for the ride and when and Ro, when he leaves semi spoilers rose is really emotional but maybe not in the same way that probably he's thinking towards rose mm-hmm. at that time um so it's like with with rose like like mickey has got such a good argument on his side when he says like you left me you 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 know you you bugger off with the doctor and i just have to stand here and wait i've got no idea whether you're going to come back with you will come back Mm -hmm. um i will just stay here and wait and i will and then rose kicks off like you don't even like trisha delaney and it's like rose you just pissed off No, but you you know why she's doing it don't you because she's he's right and she knows he's right and she's literally like i don't have anything to say to this because i don't like being attacked in like it's like those things that's like i'm in this picture and i don't like it you know how when like memes are shared from the internet um i was gonna say like like if if mickey smith were or if we had our own mickey smith that was in that same position that we he he said to us oh you know my girlfriend's pissed off with another bloke all over time and space or gone to sheffield yeah or something like in terms of what would be grounded in reality we would say to him screw up yeah literally get like, like we, we 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 know people like friends of ours who've been in relationships that probably weren't good mm. and we've said to them get out of there yeah i know you love them but it's, it's not. not worth Mm-mm. your own sort of like mental state degradation or just, yeah or, or how much this is hurting you to keep giving along with it it's going to be hard to leave them to begin with because you love them so much but it's but going to be better for you in the long pain is run. better than long-term pain exactly so if, if like if if that was someone in our life we'd be saying mickey get the hell out of there yeah and it's good to see that things do kind of develop in terms of how much they see each other yeah and you see Mickey's character develop a lot next series which is going to be really exciting so if you if you are watching this for the first time and you're seeing mickey just kind of be like a bit more of like a comic relief kind of character because he he kind of is mm. like the, the mickey the idiot playing up on it isn't because he's thick obviously we know he's not no, we've seen he's him very, be a really strong yeah. character and we'll continue to see that as the series progresses um but he's more being framed as mickey the idiot because the doctor's simply jealous yeah and i mean you get like, that look don't you at the beginning when mickey turns up in the tardis give her a passport and the, you get that shot that very quick shot of the doctor looking them over to, as if to sort of and obviously you get that shot when he's looking at them on the cctv outside his tardis and, and he lies about what he's looking yeah, at and, that stuff. Kind of and stuff. even and even at the end when the doctor realizes that mickey's like run off and he says to rose you know we can we can wait, we can for wait. Him. like he he doesn't he doesn't like mickey but that's simply down to the fact that he's he's getting to knob or mm. potentially knob the woman that he's falling in love with or has already fallen in love with um but he's never gonna go so far as to do anything bad well to i him. mean he wouldn't like want to upset and her would that's, he? that's i find i find that exactly and i find that that's that kind of approach to his character or the doctor's approach to mickey is exemplified the most when Rose comes back after trying to find Mickey and the doctor says, did you find Mickey? Yeah. He didn't say, did you find Ricky? Did you find the idiot? He yeah. just said, did you find Mickey? And he, it's obvious, as Rose even says from like, he's only messing about. He doesn't, he doesn't think you're an idiot. He doesn't yeah. know you're called Mickey. I mean, he's Ricky. relied he's just, on him He's in the just past, winding so. you up. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I really like that we see that mm. from the doctor. We see that side of, of the ninth doctor specifically that, he does care when he sees Rose come back into the TARDIS with tears down her face. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be like, ha ha, I told you, Mickey's an idiot. Yeah. You should have a slice of this instead. Yeah, he's very kind of, it's a weird kind of like, 
fatherly figure but at the same time not fatherly figure like do you know what i mean like it's that very kind of like i genuinely care about you and if you're upset by this then i want to make it better so i will always be here for you but if this ever goes anywhere further than that i'm okay with that too exactly but i'm not going to push it i'm just going to sort of lie here in hopeful waits i guess mm. i mean we we don't really know like what the, the doctor's relationship past was like i mean obviously he has a granddaughter yeah. in the 60s so it means obviously partner child child from there mm-hmm. suppose if she actually is his granddaughter that is a whole different conversation yeah. which will probably never, never get ever get to. discussed in the grand scheme of doctor who it'll be really cool caroline ford is still alive so please get a show when i get her in for something <laughs> Because why not just have a back that isn't in the five doctors? Mm. Like, that would be really cool. Um, but the doctor seeing Rose in that way is, it continues to get explored. And this is just a really subtle way of seeing it again. Mm. And it comes out, at the, it comes about because of Rose and Mickey's turmoil, which again, all of this happens off screen, but the doctor can read Rose like a book. Yeah. By now, and at also least. The fact, and also the fact that Mickey just pisses off. Yeah. Like, it's kind of obvious Bye. that he's kind of stormed off. Because he would at least come and say goodbye to the Doctor and Jack after all that crap they've been through. Even <laughs> though Mickey's not really there. No. He's literally just, like, you know, stropping about on the uh, on the pier. Yeah, just thinking, oh, yeah, she's run off to the Doctor again. Um, yeah, I'll go on then run. I mean, I sort of don't really blame him for how he acts at the end of the episode. Because, no, of like, course not. Because, you know, he makes... I personally feel like he makes the right decision in just walking away. Um, Mm -hmm. I sort of, I don't know whether it would be, it's because I'm just the sort of person that would have to sort of go up to them and be like, I'm leaving. Like I'm giving you the explanation Um, because I don't really like leaving things like unknown or unfinished sort of thing. Um, Yeah. But like, I don't think he makes a bad decision in leaving um i think he actually makes a good decision for himself because it's like you know i've told you why i'm angry like i've told you why i'm upset with you you've chosen to disregard that information and literally just have a go at me for shagging trissa delaney um so you know i deserve better and obviously rose even admits that at the end she's like he deserves better um and then stares at egg and is just like i wish i could have a better life again but then it's like she says like oh it'd be nice to start afresh does she, do you really think she wants to start afresh? Like, uh, you never want to start afresh if this was your life, would you really? No. Like, it's one of those things that, you know, we'd all kind of kill for an adventure with the Doctor. So, well, you know, I would. I don't know about you, but... That's under the t-shirt. <laughs> stares at egg. <laughs> Lunch, dinner, stares at egg. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Lunch, dinner, stares at egg. No, I think there'd be two different t-shirts. Lunch, dinner, egg, and then stares, stares at, at egg. egg. Um, and Jules will come over and go, why are all these t-shirts about me? <laughs> no. Get it? Because he's an egg. Lol. Funny. Ha. Um, I'm hilarious. Totes. Um, but y- you've I've completely lost my point now. I don't know what I was saying. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sorry. I brought up eggs and she's gone. But I mean, to be honest, there's like, we, we sort of discussed the plot, the, the extrapolator stuff. None of that's really that important. It's kind of present for the rest of the series, the extrapolator itself, and then kind of just disappears off again. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming maybe it's just absorbed into the TARDIS hardware, basically. Pops. But otherwise, yeah, it's more of just a character study, character study. Like I said, Jack, he's just kind of there. Yeah, he's not really like, in he, it. I mean, he is, but... He, he's there looking hot, lots of uh, oh, lovely I mean. dialogue. <laughs> let's do the whole uh, here's the chin plan the doctor goes here's the plan like he <laughs> said nice plan and then the uh just sort of playing upon the doctor's sort of big hard on for the extrapolator <laughs> that line can i just add when the doctor flips it over that way he delivers that fantastic and he just shakes his head in like oh god oh. <sighs> like i love that line so much it's like when you know anyone has that you see something you just think oh god oh that's mm. mm. That's good mm. stuff. I see a good PC build Usually on Reddit. Usually when like, I'm looking at dessert. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> or a good that's, meal. That's one for the comments and the Twitters. What makes you do the old little head flick and the, mm. the doctors? Fantastic. What is what is the thing that makes you do that? That is our question, <laughs> question of, of the, the week. week. Question of the week. No. no. But that's our... We're going to do that. This week, tell us in the comments or on Twitter at, at WhoCulture using the hashtag Escaping uh, Apart from any questions you might have for next week, which is uh, Bad Wolf. <gasps> the words that have followed us through time and space. Ooh. That moment of the Doctor oh, like yeah. playing up on the whole... We've heard two words following us everywhere we go. 
And then he goes, nah, it's just a coincidence. I love that, that proper misdirection of, oh my God, we're finally going to find out about what's going on here. Nah. And then he still bait and switches you. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic. Um, um, we that's can, what's coming up next. So if you've got We can talk about the next time. We will do, yeah. No, uh, if I you've mean, got any questions now. regarding... No, no, no. I'm just... Let me finish my no. point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, people. That was if very loud. If you have any questions regarding uh bad wolf next week then please let us know either in the youtube comments if you're watching or listening to the youtube version of this podcast or if you're on whatever podcast app you're on i will get apple sorted out i apologize i've had so many tweets and stuff saying can you please get this stuff on apple i need to get it sorted out with our podcast resident mr wilborn uh i really do i just keep forgetting i've got so much stuff to do um especially now i'm back after a week off mm. uh please let us know on the twitters at Who Culture using the hashtag Escaping Castebrus. I'm on Twitter at Pickup Change Toe, and Amy is on Twitter at Ames underscore Elizabeth. But yes, to wrap things up, the next time. Ugh. This has been on my mind since we started this series. We've mentioned this before that after, I think, Aliens of London, they moved any two part of next time to after the credits. Yes. So if you aren't wanting to see anything about next week's episode, you can just flick the TV off and just don't get anything spoiled whereas aliens of london comes straight in with the next time and goes look here's the doctor he's out of the room he's obviously survived yeah. if you don't want to see the next time don't bother this one's obviously different because it's not a two-parter uh even though i kind i kind uh say kind of consider these to be three mm, nah, it's no two. it's two um i was thinking more of series uh three ignore me right um like this next time basically spoils the entire episode, episode. like it gives you the whole setting doesn't give you like specific reasoning or any major plot points yeah. in terms of what happens to certain characters, but it just goes, here's uh, here's what's happening. There's the weakest link. There's Big Brother. There's, is it Trini, Trini and Susanna? Trini and Susanna, yeah. Uh, and then there's the... Uh, the good old Dalek. Daleks. Have fun. Now, I remember though, seeing this episode for the first time in 2005 and seeing the next time and crapping myself because the Daleks were coming back. Yeah. As mentioned before, if you looked at the Doctor Who website back in 2005, you were downloading Real Player. Mm -hmm. You could download the uh, the high quality or low quality versions of the Next Time trailers at like I don't know 160p. Oh joy! Because goodness knows what they were running out back then, uh, based on your crappy dial-up or maybe broadband if you were super Ooh, swish internet space modem. and just watching that, watching that Next Time over and over again for a week because of that alert, alert, we are detected line just. Oh, that got me really excited, but also spoils the whole episode. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I said to you, didn't I? I was like, it's basically, it's like, Rose, scared, or the weakest link. Doctor is like, oh, what's that beam thing? And then, oh, she gets evicted. It's like, mm, people are dying. Great fun. And then it's Jack going, oh, I'm trapped in a room with some robots. And then it's literally like the person my who's... Masters, they, my masters, they fear the Doctor. But... Tell me who are they? And, and then, then that should have been where they yeah. are. That should have been where it ended. The I know those ships, they were destroyed. Obviously, they survived. Alert, alert, we are detected. That section could Just have been removed. didn't need it, yeah. Do not spoil the Daleks coming back. Nah. That should have been a much bigger twist. Like I said, I knew that was coming before it aired because the next time trailer gave it away. And as much as I was excited, the 10-year-old me was like, holy crap, Daleks! Mm. But I mean, shouldn't like, have been done. you appealing to kind of like the adults and the kids is something that Moffat does quite well. Not Moffat, sorry. Russell, Russell T. Davis, Davis does quite well because he plays up to that kind of more adult um, side of Doctor Who that I suppose you don't really get with some of the later series. Mm. Um, and so I really feel like it would have been so much more exciting for everyone had they not revealed the monster of the week sort of thing for the next week yeah. because like the kids would have been like, oh, exciting, I wonder what it's going to be. And the adults would have been like, hmm, I'm intrigued. I wonder what kind of thingy this is gonna be and like you know if some of them were clever enough to work it out then so be it but yeah like you said it literally does it just kind of ruins the whole episode obviously it doesn't ruin the second part of the episode but no. like you basically don't need to watch i mean obviously do watch next week because it's a, a <laughs> yeah, incredible episode um yeah. but like yeah you could essentially just like you know the plot and it's really annoying <laughs> yeah i mean i I think that the reason why they added it in, in the end is because, A, it would have got people excited, yes, but also because this was the first series, they didn't know Ratings. how well this would or wouldn't do. They wanted to make sure people stuck around. Mm -hmm. They wanted that retention through the entire series. You look at series 12 of Doctor Who and you see how much the ratings just plummet yeah. 
throughout the episode. They do kind of pick up at the end because everyone was fascinated about the timeless child stuff. God knows Ugh. why. Uh, <laughs> uh, long story. Um, but they needed to make sure people stuck because mm-hmm. like the, the the finale would have been one of the big things, I guess, that the BBC would have looked at and gone, okay, the finale, it was obvious by the end of the series, nobody cared, we're not going to renew it. Mm-hmm. But um, obviously they wanted to keep people in. So they give them a little snifter of Daleks. Fine. Get people but coming back. If, if it were, if this were like a series in, if this was series two, I doubt they'd have spoiled the Daleks nah, being in the episode. Not. But annoyingly, they did. But at the end of the day, the episode is now fifteen years old. Yep. So, so it's not really like it matters anymore. No. But we can still give our honest opinions about how things play out. We're watching this as if we've watched it for out. the first time. So I mean, we're not. We're just Shh. picking it apart. Not the point. We're picking it apart, but like we already know it, but we're picking it apart even more. For all of the fellow nerds listening who want to hear more in-depth opinions and stuff about Doctor Who like we would because we're cool and that's why we've done the podcast in the first place. We're nerds. We are nerds indeed. But that about wraps it up for episode 11 of Escaping Kasturbaris Boomtown. I hope you have enjoyed it. Apologies again for the sort of semi-radio silence over last week that we did, we took off <laughs> from the podcast. Apologies uh i hope we can i hope you can forgive us and we will uh i'll send you virtual cookies or you can get real cookies moving on uh <laughs> from if me. you have any questions regarding uh next week's episode bad wolf then please let us know in the comments below if you're on youtube or over on twitter if you're are listening on your podcast platform of choice at who culture using the hashtag escaping Kasturberus. i have been rich you can follow me on twitter at pickup change tone and i have been amy and you can follow me at ames underscore elizabeth until we see you all again take care of yourselves be good go kill daleks stuff things i've no idea where i was going with that also outro. follow me on instagram instead of twitter because i don't use twitter that much okay thanks <laughs> yes <laughs> and we'll see you next week bye, bye.